Hello and welcome to the program. This is the Black Ponder. I am Neil Trotter. And today, or this video, we're going to continue our video series that I created. This video series is called Why is the Black Ponder called the Black Ponder or something like that. Why did I put the, the name Black <laughs> or the, the title Black in the, the Black Ponder title for the YouTube uh, my YouTube username, why did I do it? <laughs> it's a frequently asked question. Well, you know, from time to time I get a asked that question. Why you gotta add that racial connotation to your channel? What's that all about? You know, you're trying to stand out, you know, I, mean, I, don't, I don't feel uncomfortable with that title. However, <laughs> I feel it's important. And we're gonna talk about why. I, I feel it's so important that we made a series about it. Or well, I did, and I wanna share with you why. So I wanna begin with a comment that I got, um, I don't know, a few weeks ago, something like that. It was on a video that I did maybe three years ago, and it was about Nietzsche's uh, Beyond Good and Evil text. And the commenter said, um, you know, now that time has gone by, have you read it, the book again, and like maybe changed your mind? <laughs> like, you should do that. And I do go back from time to time and read books that I've read before. You know, it's good to reread books, especially philosophical books. And my opinion really hasn't changed much. Um, Beyond Good and Evil is about uh, well, it's Nietzsche's take on the idea of morality, and that morality is just a um, false construct. You know, just something that's created, and it's a boundary. You know, it's a limitation. It's something that humanity has to overcome. And what you really need to do is create your own individual uh, truth or like to discover it and then um, follow your life with your individual truth. And I personally think that's a little short-sighted because you really have to think about, okay, what's true for you, right? And if you just focus on you as the individual and what's best for you and what you need to follow, you might accidentally do things that mess up other people's truths, right? And you know, you might do something that dismisses somebody else's truth and you want, might not even be paying attention. Right? That's important to pay attention to the repercussions and the consequences of what you do because it, it, even if it benefits you because what benefits you might indirectly or even directly um, mess up somebody else or block somebody else from discovering their truth. And that's what I want to talk about today. And we're going to use this book, this great book that I read. It's called The Body is Not an Apology. It's by Sonia Renee Taylor. And this book right here has some deep philosophy. It has some deep philosophy. It really does. And, you know, one of the best books I've read this year. And we're going to discuss about this idea of truth and how it relates to identity and how truth is about diversity and acknowledging the differences between people and how focusing on one identity or one purpose or a single individual and what's best for that person might be dismissing other people's realities, truths, and what's uh, best for them. So we're going to talk all about that. So here at the Black Ponder, we'll, we read quotes from the books and then we add uh, you know, interesting commentary to try and figure out what's being said. Uh, and then hopefully we can continue with the comment section down below. So I begin with my, the first quote that I picked here. This is actually from the prologue, page 10 of the prologue, as this is the second paragraph. When we hear someone's truth and it strikes some deep part of our humanity, our own hidden shames, it can be easy to recoil into silence. We struggle to hold the truths of others because we have so rarely had the experience of having our own truths held. Social researcher and expert on vulnerability and shame, Brene Brown says, if we can share our story with someone who responds with empathy and understanding, shame can't survive. Let me read you some notes that I put on the margins. Because I do that, trying to understand what's going on. I put, truth is dismissed when there is no empathy. Understanding a variation of truth within the universal truth of humanity. <laughs> you know, it's just a note that I was thinking about. And, you know, I think that relates to the, the, the title name of the Black Ponder, right? Some people, I get these messages where, oh, you know, you're just a ponderer. Why you got to put Black Ponder, right? And I, I bounce back, that back off to you. Why you got to dismiss the truth of me? <laughs> because being black is a truth that I have, <laughs> okay? 
and it shouldn't be dismissed. And it is a truth that is often not acknowledged. Now, some people might feel that, oh well, you know, it's just this fabrication and it shouldn't be acknowledged because it's not real. But it is real. And we're gonna talk about why. I go to quote number two. This is page eight here. And here, uh, the author is quoting the scholar, the uh, law professor, the um, basically critical theorist, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. Kimberly Crenshaw was uh, the person that gave the name to this concept, which has been studied for a long time, called intersectionality. Now I know, I know intersectionality. That's that's a, a taboo word, and uh, you know some people get a little perturbed when you mention that because it's part of the feminist thought. But you know, there's some truth behind it. And we, for, so if you're unfamiliar with that term, Sonia Renee Taylor quotes Kimberly Crenshaw, and I'll just read you part of this quote. Various biological, social, and cultural categories, such as gender, race, class, ability, sexual orientation, religion, caste, age, and other axes of identity, interact on multiple and often simultaneous levels. Now, let's stop there for a minute. Those are all truths. Now, some people might not agree with that, but they are. We're going to talk about why. These various truths, uh, gender, that's a truth. Race, a truth. These might not be acknowledged, but they are truths. Class, ability, all right, that's a truth too. Sexual orientation, religion, caste, age. These are all truths that we need to acknowledge. Black ponder, okay? Black is truth, ponder is truth. Okay, these are all aspects of one identity. I'll continue with the quote. We should think of each element or trait of a person as inextricably linked with all the other elements in order to fully understand one's identity. Okay? We got to consider all aspects of one identity to really get an, an understanding of the truth behind a person. Okay? So that's the first thing. Acknowledging somebody's truth by understanding their cultural categories, which makes an influence on that person's truth. I skipped two lines down to what now we're outside of Cren Crenshaw's quote and we're back to what Taylor is saying. Put plainly, none of us are monodimensional. Let me repeat that. None of us are monodimensional, okay? For example, I'm not just a ponder, <laughs> right? I have many different aspects about me. Uh, and one of those aspects is being black. And that needs to be acknowledged. Why? Because, it's, because we're trying to understand truth. Philosophy is all about the examination of truth. Okay, let me continue on page nine. So, Sonia Renee Taylor discusses this concept called radical self-love. Radical self-love is very important. And we're gonna talk about that concept. Now you might hear the, the phrase radical self-love and you might be dismissive. Right? You might say, oh, well, it sounds kind of new age, kind of like hippie, far out radical alternative. Uh, but don't, you know, for, if you're thinking like that, don't be so dismissive. You know, you don't say about that about, you know, philosophical concepts like absurdism, for instance, or like Rand's objectivism. <laughs> what about that, right? All the Randians in the audience. Aristotle's the golden mean. That's not like hippie new age. Nietzsche's eternal recurrence. <laughs> you know, that's another uh, philosophical concept, <laughs> right? Uh, we take all those things seriously. Uh, so I'm taking this, what she's proposing here, Taylor's radical self-love. You know, let's look at this as a philosophical concept. And radical self-love is more than just a philosophical concept, uh, but we're just going to focus on that, right? Because this is a philosophy channel. So here I begin on the second line of page nine. Radical self-love demands that we see ourselves and others in the fullness of our complexities and intersections and that we work to create space for those intersections. Mm -hmm. It's important. Understanding the fullness of the complexities of an individual and not be so dismissive. Using me as an example with my title, Black Ponder. Um, black <laughs> Ponder. That's part of my identity and that's not to be dismissed. And to go further in that point and what Taylor is saying, race, gender, ability, all those cultural categories, they're not to be dismissed. They're real. They hold truth 
about an individual. And once we create space for those truths and the way they intersect with each other, then we're truly able to examine the, the reality of a person, the, the true meaning of what a person is. But let me continue. I'm going to skip down. We're still on page nine. This is the sixth to the last uh, line. In case you're following along, you got this book. Radical self-love invites us to love our bodies in a way that transforms how we understand and accept the bodies of others. This is not to say that we magically like everyone. Okay. This is important, what I'm about to say next. It simply means we have debates and disagreements about ideas and character, not about bodies. So why is that important? Because now we're talking about philosophy. <laughs> because what is a huge part of philosophy? Having debates and disagreements about ideas and character. That's a major part of what philosophy is. And it jumped at me because what she's saying, Taylor, is you know acknowledging the truth of an individual, all aspects of that individual, you can become more philosophical and you can start to focus on the truth. So here we are on page 10, and this is the second paragraph here. Radical self-love is indeed our inherent nat natural state, but social, political, and economic systems of oppression have distanced us from that knowing. Let me read you my notes. We must deeply examine our current way of thinking to see how our truth is obscured. So what I mean by that, by the notes, and, and to follow up to the quote that I just read here, uh, systems of oppression, economic and political, and social, um, we need to examine those systems. Why is it that we just dismiss, <laughs> you know, when race or gender or ability or any of those social cultural aspects of identity are uh, mentioned? We just dismiss them. Why do we do that? Why? <laughs> Why do we say, like, oh, that's not important? What is it that motivates that response within us? So I'm going to skip to page 14 here. This is the fifth line. What if we all understood the inherent vastness of our humanity and therefore occupied the world without apology? What if we all became committed to the idea that no one should have to apologize for being a human in a body? What if we made room for everybody so that no one ever had to stand on someone else's foot? How might we change our lives? How might we change the world? Now this book right here is about uh, body positivity. It's about acknowledging all different kinds of bodies and how they look. Not just uh, super skinny, white, blonde, blue-eyed, white girls or, or super buff and six-pack ab dudes that look like Fabio, right? It's about you know acknowledging all different kinds of bodies and not being sorry for not meeting those standards. That's what this book is about. But I'm gonna take it to a more general sense. I do that often with books. I tell, I'm gonna take it to a more general sense and say that we need to acknowledge just diversity. You know, we need to not be not be apologetic about being different. Why? Why is that? Why should I put black ponder instead of just ponder? Why am I not sorry about that? <laughs> Let me read you my note. We need to acknowledge all truths, uh, and not just the truths that exist because of the erasure of others. <laughs> Every once in a while, I also get comments that ask me, where's the African philosophy? <laughs> you know, where's the philosophy by black people? Where's that all at? And it's there, <laughs> it's there, but we, you don't know it because it's not part of the official philosophical canon that you experience when you go to like Western civilization based schools. All right? They don't include all the other philosophy, you know. I mean, first of all, we have Eastern philosophies that are often dismissed by Western cultures. But then, you know, there's philosophies in many different cultures that, you know, are erased, <laughs> right? Uh, they're not even acknowledged because when somebody stands up or like points out, um, you know, I have this identity, they're like, oh, that's not important. <laughs> you know, we just well, we're just thinking about thought, or let's not go there, or let's not acknowledge the differences between uh, people. You just have to think a certain way, it's a certain standard, a certain canon. 
So how can we change the world if we, by acknowledging difference, diversity, uh, different identities, I say by, we can change the world by get, becoming closer to what is true. What is humanity? The true nature of humanity. You know, that's a philosophical question. And in that way, we change the world. Let me go to page 18 and read you the second paragraph here. The argument that people choose to be this way or that other is at its core an argument about difference and our inability to understand and make peace with difference. The notion of choice is a convenient scapegoat for our bias and bigotries. Logic says, if people are choosing to be different, they can just as simply choose to be the way I believe they should be. Mm -hmm. What we must ask ourselves instead is, why do I need people to be the way I believe they should be? It's a good question to ask yourself. The argument about choice is a projection. There are endless things in the world we do not understand. And yet, we live in a culture where we are expected to know and understand everything. Humans are rarely given permission to not understand without someone calling us failures or stupid. So off the time in the comments, <laughs> what I get or people ask me, why do I call myself the Black Ponder? It's as if I chose being black, like that's a choice. <laughs> like, you're just putting that out there to be different because you know, you're just trying to be different. You, that's just you trying to get attention. Right? It's just silly. You need to like be colorblind. Right? Uh, philosophy is beyond that. <laughs> but listen, like I didn't choose to be black. Right? Nobody chooses to be black that is black. At the same time, being black has consequences. Real consequences. Consequences that affect you socially, economically, politically. Uh, and they can't be denied. <laughs> they cannot be denied. And to dismiss that to say like oh it's just a choice you're just choosing that it's really just to dismiss one's truth is to dismiss my truth to dismiss the truth of all other black people and not just you know race we're talking gender we're talking uh, sexual orientation we're talking about ability i'm talking about people who are disabled people in wheelchairs for instance people who have uh, mental disabilities all those differences when we dismiss those realities that have true consequences because you might not be aware of it and you might not even understand it, uh, you are denying truth. That's why this is important because philosophy is all about coming to terms with truth. Let me skip down a few lines. We're still on page 18. We don't have to work to understand something when it is someone else's fault. Uh -huh. Right? If you chose to be black, then I don't have to understand what it means to be black. You know, I don't have to understand that because I, you know, I don't get it. Uh-oh, I don't get it. That means I don't understand something. And I can't not understand something. I read Aristotle, for goodness sake. I read Socrates. <laughs> of course I should be able to understand what it means to be black, but you don't. And therefore you decide to make that a choice. And rather than accepting that, oh, this is actually the truth of this individual. This is the truth of this person. And I'm not aware of that. Which is okay. It's okay to not be aware of something. Uh, that's what philosophy is all about. Coming to terms with what you know and what you don't know. This famous concept of Socrates himself. Know that you don't know. We continue, page 19. We're at the sixth line of this second section here on page 19. When we liberate ourselves from the expectation that we must have all things figured out, we enter a sanctuary of empathy. Being uncertain, lacking information, or simply not knowing something ought not to be an indictment against our intelligence or value. It's okay not to know. That's the first step of philosophy. <laughs> I don't know what this is about. Let me think about this. Let me critically analyze this. Let me uh, converse with people who do know, know the experience. And you know, let's go back and forth. That's what it's all about. Skipping down uh, three lines. Not knowing is an opportunity for exploration without judgment and demands. It leaves room for the possibility that we might conduct all manner of investigation and after said research is completed, we may still not get it, whatever it may be. Understanding is ideal, but it is not an essential ingredient for making peace. Buddhist teachings 
tell us that the alleviation of suffering is achieved through the act of acceptance. Genuine acceptance invites reality without resistance. Invites reality without resistance. You know, understanding truth, you know, or, you know, trying to understand truth because you might not understand it completely, but being in that mode of trying, um, that's a philosophical mode. That's a healthy uh, philosophical mode. And I think, you know, being in that mode is the first step toward healthy, constructive philosophy. And I put in my notes here, meaningful philosophy embraces the truth of not knowing everything. <laughs> right? You know, uh, some philosophers or some people who are really hardcore into philosophy, they feel like they know everything or that with philosophy it is possible to know everything. <laughs> and that's not true. It's more about the pursuit of understanding but not necessarily the complete obtainment of like absolute understanding. Accepting reality without complete understanding. That's what I put in my notes here. So we're gonna continue. Page 20, this isolated sentence that's in the middle of the page here. What are you willing to stop struggling to understand for the sake of peace? Mm -hmm. People get into like serious debates and like they get extremely stressed out. People get into fights, you know, really messed up fights. You know, people agonize because they, you know, they struggle and they just can't come to grips with understanding certain things. Like why the Black Ponder calls <laughs> his channel the Black Ponder. I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't like it. Rather than just like, well, I don't understand why you call it your channel Black Ponder. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, can you, you know, maybe I can learn something. <laughs> now you have a peaceful, critical, progressive discussion. And you might not agree with what, I, what I'm saying, but at least you're like not already made your conclusion from the, you know, from the get-go. Page 21 here, and I continue. This is the third line. Rather than owning that we don't understand someone's experience, we shrink it or stuff it into our tiny capsules of knowledge. We homogenize it by proclaiming we are all the same. Okay, and then I put in my notes here. We say that there is only one reality. Some people say that their individual truth is the only truth that actually is. <laughs> and that's, that's bogus. But instead, you know, just using my example, black ponder, but you know, any, any identity for like me being black, um, somebody who has like some, a mental disability, maybe they're suffering from PTSD or they have like a clinical anxiety disorder of some sort. And you might not understand that. And they're going through a tumultuous time and you're just telling them, oh, just brush it off, you know, man up, <laughs> you know, uh, don't be a drama queen instead of like taking a step back and saying hmm maybe this person is actually going through a, a pretty bad experience one that I do not understand maybe I should step back and think about what's happening here and ask and listen and be receptive to the feedback that this person is giving me and maybe I can learn something and understand better the truth of the actual situation likewise <laughs> When, uh, you know, you read Black Ponder, you know, like, oh, this guy, I, he's just showing off. He's just uh, uh, trying to be different. What is this, you know, this nonsense? Instead of just like, well, let, why is he calling himself the Black Ponder? What, what is that all about? I mean, like, what, does he, what does he have to say about that? Why, what's the deal with that? Oh, race is actually a thing. Oh, there are actual real consequences and real circumstances that influence people based off of the, their race and those influences are philosophical perhaps we can use philosophy to recognize and understand the truth of the consequences of race despite race being a social construct we can use philosophy to understand and even overcome the negative real consequences that race has on people that's all I'm saying when I call myself the Black Potter. So accepting our denial of truth is the first step to actually beginning to come to terms with, with and maybe even understanding what truth is, the truth of humanity. 
Uh, overcoming denial is the first step to recovery. <laughs> That's like a famous tenet, right? So let me read you page 77 here. This is the fourth line right here. Removing ourselves as a barrier to other folks' radical self-love only becomes possible when we are willing to fear facingly examine our beliefs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got the beady eyes here, letting you know that's important. That's important. Uh, fearless, fear facingly examine our beliefs. It is not enough to transform our relationship with our physical and emotional selves and leave the world around us unexamined or unaltered. You know, when you read the Black Potter, for instance, you go, Pfft. please. The Ponder philosophy is above that. That doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should re-examine that assumption. Messages we received about the validity and invalidity of our own bodies did not occur in a vacuum. True that. We are simultaneously receiving and spreading those messages. Mm -hmm. Why is it that you get that automatic response of black? <laughs> black ponder, please, give me a break. Where did that come from? Okay, that wasn't automatic. Somebody, something wasn't planning in your mind to give you that response. What was it? Here I skip down seven lines. Although each of us is inherently enough, quotes, to be loved, valued, cared for, and treated with respect, our effects to raise systems of oppression and injustice will require more than our niceness. But I am uh, a good person. I am nice to everyone. You, know, you might say that to yourself has never toppled one systematic inequality or interrupted the daily acts of body terrorism. Okay, we're gonna get that concept, body terrorism. Let me just continue. Level against humans throughout history. You are enough. Being good or nice is not. Okay, let me read you my uh, notes here. We must deeply examine how our actions and beliefs impact others, okay? We must deeply examine how our actions impact other people. We go back to the beginning of the, the video where I brought up the comment about the Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil. And, you know, I think it's not enough to just uh, pursue your own truth and just, you know, do whatever it takes to realize your full potential on your own individually, right? Uh, because oftentimes when you do focus too heavily on your individual self, and I'm not saying not focus on your individual self. I'm not saying that either. You know, it's important to do things for you. But also, when you do things for you, think about how what you're doing affects other people. Now, sometimes you might affect other people and they might have some hardships. Sometimes that does have to happen. But oftentimes, it doesn't. And oftentimes, you're really messing people up when you are just so focused on realizing your goal and realizing you, what you believe is true and you're completely dismissing it and ignoring what other people's truths are, you're really messing them up. And to the, what I'm saying when messing up, I'm saying you're blocking their ability to realize their truth. You know, that's wrong. And that happens all the time. Certain people can realize their truth, like certain kinds of philosophers, uh, dead white guy philosophers, <laughs> right? They can realize their truth, but black ponderers or ponderers of color, or ponderers of certain sexual orientations, or ponderers of certain genders, uh, they're just left on the sideline. And they're completely dismissed, even though they have a lot of meaningful truth and knowledge to contribute. And you're just completely dismissing them. I'm not saying you, you might not be, but a lot of people are, you know? You know what I mean? And we gotta be careful about the extremely popular philosophies uh, we gotta be very critical about them because you take them too far and you might be dismissing other people's truths. So body terrorism, I brought that up, is another concept that um, Sonia Renee Taylor brings up. And you know, this concept, she's just saying that we're constantly um, bombarded with messages, social norms and cues, ideas, concept, imagery, that there's only a certain kind of body that's acceptable. A right, certain kind of identity and any identity outside that what is acceptable is ugly, is wrong, is perverted, is a monster, is not human. Right? And the truths of those identities are dismissed and they're not acknowledged. Even though 
that is part of human truth. There are all those dismiss and unacknowledged identities. Um, so what happens, it is a form of terrorism of the body, of all these bodies that are acknowledged. And I would say go even further and say it's a, it's a terrorism on humanity itself, right? Because how can human being, how can we as a species understand who we truly are if we don't acknowledge most of what humanity is, when we try to erase it, when we dismiss it, when we say it's not important and we dehumanize it? We can't progress as a species. We're blocking ourselves and we're, you know, turning around and going backwards. I certainly would say it's a form of terrorism. Among, among other types of terrorism is a philosophical terrorism. So now I'm going to start on page 81 here. First sentence. Systems and structures of body terrorism are constructed, governed, and operated by humans. That is, <coughs> cough, cough, by us. We built them and only our intentional, concentrated efforts to deconstruct body terrorism in ourselves and in our world will tear them down. Let me read you my notes here. Systems don't run on their own. People run systems. It's true. Systems are dependent on people being complicit with those systems. And these systems of erasure, uh, not acknowledging all these identities that are actually part of human truth. Um, being complicit with that, you know, me just calling myself the ponder and not saying black ponder is being complicit, right? So I'm not being complicit. I'm going to say the black ponder because it's time that we acknowledge human truth. That's what I'm talking about. I'm skipping now to the third paragraph here. Destroying the system of body terrorism requires an investigation into our unconscious beliefs about other bodies. What is that? The philosophical investigation is it not a philosophical query <laughs> remember we are not our beliefs we're not our beliefs that's just true beliefs are implanted into us by our society and we can change those beliefs if we use critical thinking and you know philosophical analysis <laughs> among many other things as well we can examine them without judgment and shame from a place of curiosity and compassion, explore the social and cultural and political messages you have received. Mm -hmm. Use philosophy to understand this dismissal and this erasure of identities that actually are part of human truth. What is going on here? Philosophize about your beliefs. <laughs> That's what I put in my notes. Yeah, there you go. Here's the last paragraph, page 81. Bodies are not the only designators of oppression, but all oppression is enacted on the body. To discuss oppression as a manifestation of body terrorism is to move the conversation out of the abstract and return it to its site of impact, the body. And I put in my notes, uh, bring philosophy out from the abstract and into the applicable, right? How can we apply philosophy today to uh, make relevant uh, progress and constructive contribution, and I, you know, part of that for me is uh, mentioning the black in the black ponder because you know that's that's a, an issue that we're struggling with today, and it's extremely obvious <laughs> that we are, and we need to take this some philosophical analysis to that issue. I'm skipping down to a seventh line here on page 82. Systems do not maintain themselves. <laughs> I just said that. Uh, I'm just repeating Taylor, just repeating her. Uh, even our lack of intervention is an act of maintenance. Every structure in every society is upheld by the active and passive assistance of other human beings. It's true. So question your beliefs and question the systems that foster those beliefs. Are they true? Are they correct? Are they right? Or are they blinding you? Are they rejecting truth? Are they rejecting different realities that actually exist and have real consequences, truthful consequences for many big people? Think about how what you believe affects others. Because truth is not just about you. Right. Truth is about every truth encompasses everybody. Right. So if we're talking philosophy here and we're talking about the examination of what is what is true, you know, what is what is real. Uh, we're not just talking about ourselves. We're not just talking about our individual self. We're talking about 
everybody. We're talking about the world. <laughs> you know, we're talking about the cosmos. But we're most certainly talking about humanity as a whole. That's for sure. And here, Sonia Renee Taylor quotes uh, civil and labor rights activist Grace Lee Boggs. Mm -hmm. I definitely need to make videos about this person too. <laughs> That's for sure. So yeah, let me like remember that. Grace Lee Boggs, as she says, any group that achieves power, no matter how oppressed, is not going to act differently from their oppressors as long as they have not confronted the values that they have internalized and consciously adopted different values. You know, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, confronting your beliefs, not just accepting them at face value and just saying, oh, you know, that's it. I, they're telling me this is this thing, now I'm gonna believe it. But when you're questioned about it, when somebody tells you, oh, philosophy um, is above race. <laughs> but then, and we observe the world, and we see that race is a huge contributor to a lot of the turmoil that's happening in the world. Uh, how do we use philosophy to overcome all that turmoil? Right? How do we do it? We just ignore it and say, well, I'll just construct a little philosophical bubble for myself and ignore the problems. And then by doing that, you are ignoring the truth. <laughs> right? You're ignoring the true issues and problems of humanity. So engage in the hard social questions. You know, don't avoid these social questions, these social uh, affairs that are happening to, to human humanity. I mean, this, these are the greatest challenges of humanity that we face today. Uh, these social issues, these issues of race, of class, of gender, of ability, of sexual orientation. You know, the fact that we're not acknowledging these social realities, these social truths. Um, you know, we're hitting a wall as a species. We can't progress further. We have to take philosophy toward this. We have to use philosophy as a tool um, to, you know, find answers to these questions, to find solutions to these problems. And that's how we are going to be able to make philosophy applicable today. Let me read you a quote from page 87 here. This is the uh, fifth to the last line here. You will make a mistake. Creating a radical self-love world requires our willingness to have challenging conversations about privilege, power, history, culture, inequality, pain, and injustice. We will mess up. Okay? We're not always going to be right. We're going to be wrong. All of us. Both sides. <laughs> uh, and it's a struggle. But we got to be up to that. You know, we got to confront our unknowingness our lack of understanding. I have to confront it, you have to confront it, we have to do that so we can get closer to truth and start solving these problems of humanity. Let me continue with uh, Taylor's quote. That doesn't mean we quit. It also doesn't mean we become defensive and retreat to judgment and blame. It means we apologize and try again holding fast to our intention to connect with other humans in different bodies from a place of compassion and shared humanity. And I skipped down three lines. Commit to engaging in a type of radical self-love communication that grows our understanding of ourselves and one another. The type of communication that fosters global change. <laughs> global change. And you know, I'm, I'm just emphasizing things that I feel are very important. But global change. You know, truth, uh, human as diversity, variations in reality, and how they're all part of human truth. These are things that we need to acknowledge. And we're not, we're not there that philo philosophically as a species yet. We're not. The philosophical canon is not there yet. But let's take it there. You know, this community of philosophy that we have now, let's, let's take it to the next level. I continue with the third paragraph here on page 88. Engage and encourage curiosity-driven dialogue, not debate or arguing. Okay, I could work on that myself. <laughs> Practice the value of sharing and listening, sharing and listening, to the perspectives of others. Others. <laughs> Listen to the perspective of others. Uh, the goal of dialogue need not be to change anyone's mind, but to offer and receive a perspective for consideration and curiosity. Isn't that what philosophy is? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Isn't that what philosophy is? Let me repeat that again. 
The goal of dialogue need not be to change anyone's mind, but to offer, okay, this is what philosophy is, to offer and receive a perspective for consideration and curiosity. That's not all of what philosophy is, but that's a huge part of philosophy, is that kind of discourse, that kind of dialectic. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm reading this book, and I'm like, dang, this got a lot of philosophy in it. And I wanted to share with you, I wanted to put a philosophical perspective on this book. So let me conclude with uh, a quote, the, the, you know, one of the last sentences in the book, <laughs> uh, page 116. Let me just conclude with this. Liberation is the opportunity for every human, no matter their body, to have unobstructed access to their highest self, for every human to live in radical self-love. So let's bring it back to my, or what I was saying at first with Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil. It's not just about your individual truth. It's about the individual truths of everybody, which is different. So think about how what you're doing to discover your individual truth affects others. That matters, right? Because you might be blocking other people's ability to realize their truth. And that's not to compromise your realization of truth for, you know, to have other people realize their truth. I'm not saying that. Don't compromise your journey toward truth. Um, I propose that by acknowledging the truths of others, you will in turn acknowledge your individual truth because the ultimate truth, the true meaning of humanity is diversity. There is no one single reality that all people fall under. Humanity is composed of countless realities that are all very important. This is what makes up the true meaning of humanity. And once we start to acknowledge that, then we can uh, start making even more progress and we can evolve even further as a species. And that's what I'm talking about. And that's why I'm continuing to call my this channel, this YouTube channel, the Black Ponder, <laughs> not just the Ponder, because I want philosophy to go that way. I want philosophy to stop ignoring the truths of others and you know just only focusing on this one sliver of humanity that's like a, you know less than a fraction of a fraction of, of a nanometer right there's just so much that we're just completely dismissing and part of that what we're dismissing is bl is blackness and is there useful philosophy that falls within uh, black identity absolutely <laughs> it is not just the black identity it is identities of various genders various sexual orientations and those philosophies from those identities are going to be different from that extremely popular western canon type of philosophy that we're all used to I'm talking about you know I'm you know I'm talking about Rene Descartes Immanuel Kant <laughs> Aristotle Socrates Plato Jean-Paul Sartre <laughs> Albert Camus, you know, I'm talking about those people. Now, those people are all very important. I'm not saying that. They're all very important and we should all study them and learn from them. I make videos about those people. But what I'm saying is that's not, we should be opening our minds to other different kinds of identities and the philosophies that they have to share too. Those are very important too. And the fact that we're dismissing that and we're not acknowledging that, we're blocking the whole benefit of what philosophy can offer to us. That's all I'm saying, right? And to that end, I just want to encourage you to check out this book, The Body Is Not An Apology by Sonia Renee Taylor. It's a, it's a very good book, a very good book. Uh, it has a lot of philosophy in it. I mean, the main message of the book is body positivity and accepting variations in body as, as valuable. So if you're into that, and everybody should be into that, you're gonna love this book too. That was great to hear. Uh, but also a lot of that philosophy where we're just talking about just identity in general and the truth behind identities, that was very important for me too. And I wanted to share that with you too. So check this book out. Well, you've been listening to The Black Ponder. Tune in next time for more Philosophical Thought.